Matt Kibbe here, your host at Kibbe on Liberty. The building behind me is where the Mont Pelerin Society meeting is being held. This, of course, is a famous gathering of mostly Austrian economists founded by Frederick Hayek. It is also the place where in 1944, the so-called Bretton Woods Agreement was hatched up by the infamous John Maynard Keynes and a guy named Harry Dexter White, who was a treasury official under FDR, later discovered to be a Soviet spy. So you can imagine how this central plan to control our currency turned out in the long run. It was the death knell to the gold standard and, and it has created all sorts of chaos ever since. I'm gonna be talking to some of the brightest brains here not just about monetary policy, not just about the Bretton Woods Agreement, but where Liberty was then, where it is today, and how we move forward. Check it out. David, thanks for doing this. Happy to. It's been um, I, it's been quite a while since we've talked, and you were here at the Mont Pelerin Society meeting um, in you, Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. In, so I'm dressed down. Yes, <laughs> nice to be here in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, and and I've had various economists talking about the Bretton Woods Agreement, and and various stuff. You are in a unique position here as as I guess the you recently left as the head of the World Bank. Mm -hmm. And you, you, have a, you have a long career in economics and finance and, and all of that, and somehow you got hornswoggled into um, accepting that position. Expl and this was, this, was, this was created out of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Explain uh, briefly what the World Bank is so that people understand. Yeah, it was created in 1944 at the, toward the end of, the, of World War II uh, with the idea of helping rebuild uh, Europe. Its first loan was to France. So the bank has five divisions or arms. I was president of each one. One of them uh, is the IBRD that makes loans to governments uh, of countries, if floating interest rate loans. So the idea is to have a loan that is beneficial uh, to the country and the people of the country. And then some of the other parts of the World Bank group, there's a, a trust fund called IDA that makes grants. There's IFC that uh, loans and makes equity investments in companies in developing countries, not, so it's not just governmental. Uh, MEGA insures political risk and ICSID helps settle disputes. So it's a broad uh, group of entities with the goal of trying to make life better for people in developing countries. Yeah, and, and your, um, your job there or your mission when you took over I think from almost day one was that you wanted to sort of refocus um, the World Bank on um, the impoverished countries and, and what would be the, the conditions to lift people out of poverty. It's, um, I've done it on this show. I'm sure we've done this at Mont Pelerin for years because we would always have this beautiful downward sloping chart showing that, that, that market capitalism and open markets were, were lifting more and more people out of extreme poverty. That number kept going down and down and down. Um, but I, I vividly remember in, in 2020 um, that the World Bank was, was one of the few governmental institutions that, that actually was willing to point out that lockdowns and shutting down economic processes and, and as, as if it's like a, a light switch was going to have a particularly devastating impact on on people at the margins, at the end of the food chain, if you will, at the end, end of the supply chain. Um, was that was that your work explicitly, or um, how did that come about? Yes, when I first came into the bank, I wanted there to be clarity of the mission, which is to have good outcomes for people in developing countries. Now, that sounds obvious, except you could have other formulations of that. You could be trying to have good outcomes for the governments in developing countries, or you could have uh, your mission be to have a lot of conferences. So I really wanted us to focus on people in developing countries. And as COVID hit and the, the, the lockdowns occurred, 
occurred in the advanced economies, the, the impact on markets for people in developing countries was clearly deeply harmful. Uh, and, so, and there was no way out of it for the people. They, were, they had, were used to selling their goods to advanced economies. That's, to an extent, the nature of the world, that, that uh, uh, people find, f f gravitate toward where the money is. And the advanced economies have this big advantage because not only do they have more GDP, but their governments can borrow much more money. So one of the immediate impacts of uh, COVID was uh, people in advanced economies st stopped taking shipments and started their governments borrowing huge amounts uh, in order to maintain social safety nets. So the developing countries, uh, and I used to do a list of all the ways that they were going to face enormous problems uh, from, the, from the lockdown. Lockdowns. In in the event, uh, as it actually unfolded, of course, we now know that the uh, closing of schools was devastating around the world. P children were going back by two years in their education, and so by 2022, we World Bank with other organizations actually found a unified view uh, that uh, it was it w w one of the most important things uh, for for the future prosperity was going to be recovering some of the learning losses and specifically on literacy and numeracy. So the foundational skills uh, had been lost during the, the lockdowns. But of course, that extended to markets as well that were simply closed for a long time. Uh, and so poverty went up uh, in the developing countries. Yeah, one of the first articles I wrote um, it was in early March of 2020 when when it looked like, uh, and I and I was shocked at the time that that many countries, including the United States, were going to embrace this this novel and quite authoritarian idea of of, of locking down the economy. And and I started immediately because I'm an economist. I started thinking about the supply chain, and and they couldn't possibly mean for everyone to stay home because people would quite quickly start dying. They would they would starve because there would be no food, no water, no electricity. Of course, they didn't mean that. But then I started thinking about the end of the supply chain. And, and uh, later, um, because of this criticism, which was not popular at the time, I became friends with someone that you may have heard of, Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. And he's an economist and an epidemiologist at Stanford who happens to have been born in Calcutta. And so he was keenly aware as both an epidemiologist who was critical of lockdowns, as an economist that understood supply chains, that the suffering would happen in those, those most devastated, um, struggling at the margins communities. And you saw that too. That's right. Uh, and so this, but this extends to many things that p people that are, uh, that are marginalized, uh, so if they're on the edge of poverty, if you have a slowdown in the world, they're the ones that are going to be hurt the most. So you could quantify that in terms of, uh, of uh, calories falling, cal caloric intake falling below sustainable levels. Children, we know, uh, suffer f in, poor, in the poorest countries, suffer from stunting. That means that during their formative years, they don't get enough food to actually build bone, bone mass, and they're shorter than they, than they would have been. That condition worsened during COVID uh, uh, because of the way the world reacted to this. Important in this, remember, China did the lockdown first and the world observed and said, hmm, they've seen the cases longer. That's their conclusion. And so there was a temptation to follow the leader uh, into lockdowns. Sweden, of course, broke the mold, said, you know, that doesn't make sense for our society. Uh, and they came out with a better result. One of the things, um, and I, I'd love to hear what, what sort of pushback you got, but one of the arguments very early on from um, critiquing the economic argument that you needed to keep the economy running, particularly to protect people at, at the very edge, was that you just care about money. It was money versus health. It's the economy versus people's safety and these things are so intimately intertwined and you just described like with, without money, you don't have food. And without an economy that's producing 
the goods and services that, that people need to survive, um, human health will decline. And wh why were we fighting about that? It, it didn't make any sense if you understood reality. I think uh, it's difficult to convince people that cost-benefit analysis has to be done on many things. There are risks all around the world, uh, so you have to weigh it against the cost, uh, you know, uh, cost and benefit. So how do you weigh the stunting of children and the illiteracy that came out versus the potential cost, especially to uh, people at risk? Um, even in, in advanced economies, they didn't want to make the distinction between the elderly or people that were overweight uh, being more at risk than children. Uh, and so I, I think it's a, it's a uh, point that spreads across economics, and it's up to, up to people to really speak out and say, wait, zero tolerance uh, of, of uh, risk isn't going to isn't going to be a successful outcome for society. You have to weigh the risks, um, and I I think we're that you know we're littered with areas where once you identify the risk, then you say it's got to go to zero. So we want zero cases of COVID deaths. Well, how are you going to achieve that, and at what cost? That needs to be asked. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. Ironically, uh, zero risk is perhaps the riskiest strategy if you're looking at all of the factors that, that contribute to human prosperity. And a somewhat different challenge is the idea of distributing vaccines in a fair and equitable way. Uh, and so it ended up in that uh, uh, instance that the only truly fair and equitable way to do vaccines was no one gets any uh, because uh, the otherwise you are uh, all over the world setting up a system where people with more money or more access uh, were getting the vaccines early on. We had, a, we had one of the early World Bank uh, loans for vaccines or grants was to Lebanon, uh, and it was c clearly on the condition that it be distributed, available to people across the country. Well, as the vaccines came in, the legislators of Lebanon uh, uh, were, 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 took the entire shipment for themselves and their family. Uh, and so then that, that uh, pushed the World Bank to suspend shipments until they could work out a, uh, a system that, that allowed the vaccines to go to people that were at risk. Um, so these are, I don't know that that's an example of anything, that's just a challenge for the world to allow uh, costs and benefits to be, calc to, be, uh, to, be, to be included in the calculation of what you're doing, uh, and also to recognize that markets are going to achieve a fairer outcome than an explicit equitable distribution. You're often going to end up with no distribution at all. It goes back to your, your important distinction that you you said quite quickly, but I want people to hear this. When you came to the World Bank, you were not going to focus on the health of governments. You were going to focus on the health and wealth of people. And that, that's a pretty fundamental difference. Th that's right. Now, that was uh, popular within the World Bank because a lot of people are working at the World Bank that actually want to see good outcomes for people across a country. And they recognize that many of the governments are not the best conduit for prosperity. Uh, and so we ended up then with uh, motivated staff. I was happy with that. Uh, that uh, really was seeking to s set up systems that uh, ended up allowing goods and services to get through the governments uh, to the to the people. I have to say it's just a, a very uphill battle. Governments around the world are able to take most of the resources for themselves and their family uh, and so it makes it a, a big challenge in fighting poverty. I would imagine. So you may have seen this um, this week um, the New York Times Magazine 
published an article, and I'll, I'll paraphrase the title of it. It said, basically, we tried lockdowns. It was a failure. Huh. And I'm old enough to remember when those of us that were saying very early on that lockdowns will be a, a humanitarian catastrophe, uh, we weren't allowed to say that. Did you get, and, and this, is, this is why I, f- I find what you did at the World Bank so remarkable, did you get a lot of blowback for linking the, the potential um, decline in, uh, or increase in, in extreme poverty to these government actions? Did, did people push back? Um, you know, one of the challenges is that a lot of the world is on autopilot. So I would say things that I thought were provocative. Uh, and there, and uh, th- if you say, okay, what's the practical result of that? So you've, you've made the point that uh, uh, lockdowns are hurting poor. Uh, and so is it that you want more money? I say, so one of the things and uh, all the bank could really do uh, as a result of that, we accelerated the uh, fundraising for IDA. That's the grant-making part of the World Bank. It's the International Development Association. So I did something the, the first time in 60 years that the bank has done this of, uh, of uh, bring forward the fundraising, recognizing the depth of the damage from COVID and the and the uh, advanced country lockdowns, and we, that was convincing to the countries. So instead of being a three-year cycle, we we went to a two-year cycle that was concluded in 2022 with a record fundraising effort for Ida uh, for Ida 20, which is what's in operation right now. So for those countries that are uh, that well that that meant more ability by the world bank to make grants under the current uh difficult circumstances in 2023 that's you know the the developing countries are and the poorest countries are going through a second really uh difficult uh crisis uh from in terms of food and energy and fertilizer so when Russia uh, uh, invaded Ukraine, it shut down the, uh, a, a big source of natural gas to Europe. So Europe went around the world collecting natural gas and is burning it, uh, did in the winter of 2022, but also will this winter and next winter, which leaves shortages r- really worldwide. Uh, there was also the, uh, uh, the cutoff of the, uh, the f- uh, fertilizer feedstocks from, feed from Belarus Rus uh, and and so and the wheat from Ukraine uh, and so the combination of that has left severe food shortages in uh, developing countries. So the that is chewing up a chunk of the resources uh, from the from the World Bank. I should point point out um, the size of the World Bank is small relative to the size of the problems going on. And so it's most important for people to recognize that the the solution has to rest in policies in developing countries themselves being improved. Uh, It's true that the advanced economies are really important by creating markets, uh, by meaning by buying things from uh, developing countries. But the single most important step that can be taken is uh, developing countries having their economies grow faster. That means the, the it's n- not rocket science. It means sound money. Uh, it means uh, low tax rates on a broad base so that the governments actually have resources, but they do it without distorting the economies. Uh, it means very much not subsidizing things that just benefit the rich within their societies. We had a running uh, battle with Nigeria, which insists on subsidizing oil and on protecting the oil company. Uh, and it uh, has maintained the impoverishment of Nigeria. Th- that plus, and uh, you know, a, uh, a very important factor is they have a dual exchange rate in Nigeria. And so that means that the government can hand out benefits to anyone it wants by giving them the favorable exchange rate. Um, and so as, as we think about the, the, the rise, the uh, p- poverty, uh, the impoverishment still going on in the world, it was made worse by COVID. 
It was made uh, worse by the by the Ukraine war and the the, the consequences of that, uh, and it's also being made worse by the policies of the developing countries themselves. I'll be speaking here at this conference also on the macroeconomic policies of the advanced economies. They're doing a lot on their own to, uh, to extend poverty in the developing world by soaking up so much of the wor world's resources in their, in their national debts and in their monetary policies. So those all combine to create a devastating situation for people in developing countries, particularly in the poorest countries. Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. I like that you say that, that this is not really something that can be solved from the top down. And I think, and, and you, you may share the, the critique of, of there's, there's a movie, a film you probably saw called Poverty, Inc., which is about, about the network of, of government assistance programs and NGOs that, that sort of treat developing countries with a patronizing attitude that they, they want to go in and sort of centrally plan things from the outside, but, but these reforms have, have to happen from within, you know, basic market reforms. And even, um, I don't know if you, did you ever get to hang out with Bono? Because, do you know who this is? Yeah, I do, I, I didn't. Uh... Um, but this, this quote from, again, the New York Times, I think it's about a year or two old now, um, and, and, and Bono has, has in it been very interested in, in figuring out ways to alleviate poverty in Africa. Mm -hmm. And he eventually came, stubbornly came around to the realization that you had to do it through capitalism. You had to do it through markets. You had to do it through trade. And I want to read this because it is kinda, it's kind of funny and, and enlightened at the same time. Um, there's a funny moment when you realize that as an activist, the off-ramp out of extreme poverty is, ugh, commerce. It's entrepreneurial capitalism. And, and he goes on eventually to say, I didn't grow up to like the idea that we've made heroes out of business people, but if you're bringing jobs to a community and treating people well, then you are a hero. So, so even Bono has sort of acknowledged that there's really only one vehicle to, to lift people out of poverty. And I, I, think, I think one of the bad guys in this story are all of the planners, this, this I'll call it the poverty industrial complex, that, that still want to sort of uh, do all of this patronizing planning. How do you get to the vision that you laid out where, where people get to sound money and, and, and allowing you know, all the, all the gray markets and the black markets where, where poor people work and, and feed their families. Um, how do you make that legal? How do you get to the rule of law? I mean, because we, we know what the rules should be, but we also know you're talking about the government corruption. We also know that that's, that's an intractable problem. Yeah, there are some bright points. One is digitalization. So remarkably, uh, there are uh, now systems that allow even the poorest people to be able to trade with money, which they couldn't do. You know, it was it was very difficult when you had to deal with physical money. Uh, the man would take the money away from the woman. Uh, the the uh, uh, the government w or and the soldiers would take the money as it was being distributed to the poor. Uh, now you have some system that might allow people for a fractional cent uh, to be able to trade, and so that is enabling. So I think you can do things 
within countries that enable private sector activity. That was one of my big pushes at the World Bank to at least include that in the menu of programs that you're trying to do. Uh, but the, the pushback and the difficulty with making this transition that you're talking about is uh, humanity, there are the problems in, uh, in the developing world, uh, particularly the poorest countries, are so deep uh, that uh, uh, that the tendency is to use governmental organizations to do humanitarian assistance. So one example occurred for me with Angola. The Angola was resisting making uh, changes that would have allowed people within their country to have money and to to begin to make progress. They have oil and they export the oil through through China and. Uh, uh, so they're stalled in terms of their advance, uh, and it's a country that could be a much could could have a much higher median income, meaning uh, uh, living standards could be raised. But as I as I tried to resist then uh, working with the government, uh, it was immediately uh, said uh, that you're you're trying to uh, stop humanitarian interests uh, interest from going going in. So what we ended up doing as a compromise uh, was to allow a certain number of projects in a country, uh, and it, it may fall into some of the categories you said about that kind of assistance, uh, operating through NGOs to try to provide poverty alleviation, and then at the same time to continue the pressure or to, to, to add to the pressure on the government to try to make changes that would allow broader prosper, prosperity for the country. Uh, this is going on around the world. So if we think about uh, populous countries that could be doing better, we can have in mind uh, Ethiopia and Egypt and Pakistan and even India, which has made some progress but could be making more progress. And th that applies in general, I think, to development. It's uh, uh, it's not making the progress that it should. Uh, one problem is the policies of the advanced economies uh, uh, that are diverting capital to themselves and wasting it. Uh, but then another problem is the individual changes country by country are simply not going fast enough. So the definition of extreme poverty is less than $2. What is the definition? It actually changed during my tenure at the World Bank. So I think it had been when I came in a dollar ninety per day, in, 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 and that's adjusted for two in two ways, uh, and was adjusted. So I uh, the, and uh, so it's uh, it, it needs to be adjusted to account for inflation. So for for some years it had been steady at that at that number because the inflation rate in dollars in the US was low but as inflation kicked in then you need to make it a real uh, number and then also because uh uh countries themselves or the the uh, ability to well the to, so the 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 true levels of needs by people included and food in particular was going up in price so there's a higher number and I've lost track it's two dollars and fifteen or so uh, but it this is extreme poverty and when you think about that that's a per capita a, an annual income of four hundred dollars or or some uh, some amount five hundred dollars per year which as as you can see is not going to be able to uh, 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 be sufficient for the person's health and well-being. So you end up with a chunk of the world in subsistence agriculture, and that's particularly difficult right now because of the shortages of, uh, of fertilizer that are coming off of the natural gas shortage uh, in in the in the world. Natural gas is the is the is the feedstock for the for basic fertilizer, and so it's been being diverted to farmers in the advanced economies, and that's leaving huge shortages across the developing world. And that means agriculture is being undermined, and that's the. That's the, the maintenance uh, uh, that's necessary for a lot of families in developing countries. There was a spike, um, an increase in extreme poverty um, 
in 2020, and I assume we are still seeing a, a, a negative trend as opposed to the positive trend that we had seen up to 2019? Uh, I don't know what current data, meaning 2023 data will show, but that continued into 2022. Uh, that was in part because global growth has been slow uh, and this I energy dislocation that I that I mentioned. So, you, and uh, the World Bank keeps that data well up to date. If you've made it this far into the show, it means I must be doing something right. Key Beyond Liberty is just one of the amazing products we created for the people. We tell emotionally compelling stories and produce educational videos for the Liberty Curious. Our award-winning documentaries personalize all things Liberty, independence, creativity, hard work, integrity, and perseverance. After the show, check out our work at freethepeople.org. And if you like what you see, donate to support what we do. That's freethepeople.org. Now back to the show. Yeah, and uh, the, there was a goal, and I, I don't know if, I think this was a World Bank goal of eliminating extreme poverty by that's 2030. Also, that's right. And that's one of the the uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations. Uh, I... I uh, tried to get people to recognize that w that a, a, a um, reachable goal was to alleviate uh, extreme poverty or to reduce it. Eliminating it is very difficult. Uh, and so I, I wanted to see forward progress. And the bad news was there, there was not forward progress. It, it, uh, the number in extreme poverty and even uh, and deeply concerning, the number in poverty by anyone's definition uh, went up uh, significantly during COVID. It had been going up prior to COVID, which I think is uh, should be of concern to the world that it, it, you don't use COVID as the excuse for this problem. It was happening before COVID. Uh, and that was, I think, uh, because the international financial system is not set up to allow growth in median income, in actual spreading of poverty, of prosperity, uh, has been uh, has has been stalling out. It, if we believe in the project, and I hope all good people do, of, of freeing people to to lift themselves out of poverty, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, it, we, we certainly do. Uh, freedom is. Uh, is in many countries in short supply. Uh, the government imposes constraints and it is able to enforce that through the economic system, through the financial system, through the currency, and through regulatory policy. In many parts of the world, you can't transfer a land title. And so there, you, I, I saw people who were staying in their uh, homestead or their, their in, in their a very small accommodation because if they physically went away, they wouldn't be able to, uh, to to get back to it. And so this is not a way to build a society or an economy. Um, and uh, it, it's important, I think, to have a starting point of sound money and property rights and individual freedom that allows uh, more rapid advance. So you left the World Bank in June of That's 2023? Right. Yes. And you are a free agent now. I take it that you're back in the world of ideas um, and speaking here at Mont Pelerin as part of that. What What is your project today? Not not to tonight, but what are you doing moving forward? Yeah, so I, I caught my breath during the summer and uh, am, am exploring and uh, I'll be announcing some of those, uh, some of those uh, undertakings. Um, so I'm, I continue my deep interest in seeing people around the world do better, and that means in terms of prosperity spreading and being, being allowed to people around the world. Uh, it's also the, uh, the importance of markets and uh, recognizing that through pricing, uh, you, build, uh, you build your economy, so I'll be working in that. And of course, my intense interest in fiscal and monetary policy, which are so off track uh, in the in the U.S., I was able at m many of these international meetings, meeting with uh, leaders from around the world, to say that the world won't be able to grow fast if you keep these policies going. But it was like what we talked about earlier: people hear that, 
they say, fine, let's go on to the next agenda item. So there's uh, a, a distinct lack of interest uh, in world leaders in finding the actual practical ways to improve the policies and the growth rates of their economies. That is the fight. That's the fight. Is there uh, a way that people can follow you? Do you do social media? I, I have been continuing my Twitter, so X, I guess it's called. And so that's uh, at sign David R. Malpass and same on LinkedIn. So that's a way. And then I've, I've uh, uh, I'll continue writing uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal. And those kind of lay out, I laid out earlier in 2023 in the journal uh, and in uh, a magazine called The International Economy, the dangers facing the world, which I think are mounting rapidly from this fragility. You, it's very challenging to have a world where the electricity grids are being shut down. And so people that had electricity won't. And so the, the, the elite within this society buy a, a diesel generator and they're burning immense amounts of, uh, of uh, fuel for those. Uh, and in the meantime, the rest of the country looks and observes and has the lights turned off. There are quite a few countries that we considered more advanced developing countries that are down to four hours a day of electricity. So you can imagine the frustration of people who are trying to educate their children, uh, trying to get, get, trying to have a small manufacturing operation. How do you do that when you have limited amounts of, uh, of electricity? So I think the energy part of the, the energy crisis is, is uh, part of the fragility. Uh, and it's also, um, the governmental structures that have reached a breaking point. Okay, thank you, David. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.